Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to PhotoApps.Expert Live Training, episode 1500, 1500. God, this sounds like we've done a lot of shows, but it's not actually quite like that. So if you're new to this whole thing, every time we start a new app, it gets a new two-digit designator, and this would be the 15th app that we have done live training on. And it's on photos. Now we've done photos before, but this is the new photos, new as of Mac OS High Sierra. And it is, uh, it's a nice little upgrade, nice little upgrade. So this show that you're watching right now is an overview show. If you're watching this live and you miss any part of this, don't worry, this show will be live and will be free forever and ever. This is just a teaser of things to come. We're going to do a basic quick overview of the entire app you know, the biggest features, we're gonna look at the whole app. And then over the course of the next several months, because Photos is a big app, we will dive deep into individual little components over the course of the live training series. I think last time I did a live training on Photos, it was, what do we end up with? Probably a good 15 videos or so. It's gonna be a while. It's gonna take a little, maybe it's not that many. Anyway, it's gonna be a while. It's a, uh, it's a pretty robust app. Photos has definitely grown from its uh, its baby years of being a little a baby thing that didn't do very much. It's still no aperture. So for those who were tuning into this going, yes, the aperture replaced, no, it's still not there, but it's getting closer. Is it ever going to replace aperture? I, I don't think so. I think that's, I think that ship has sailed. So let's not expect it to replace aperture, but for a lot of people, it's enough. It really is good enough. All right. So for those of you who are watching live, um, do, oh, Daddy MCC is telling me there's an awesome update on Final Cut Pro 10 today. Yes, the 10.4 update has shipped. I haven't yet up installed it, but that's not what this show is about. Um, so real quick, for those who are watching live, if you want to participate in the chat, you certainly can. You are, you, there's a chat here. You can see if you type at Photo Joseph in front of it, especially if there's a lot of people, I will see that and be able to grab it. Usually we don't have a huge live audience for this show, so this comments are a little slower, but if you can, if you got a question, put, pop it in there and I will do my best to address it. Um, Frank Lovett has already got a first question. It says, have you a view about using Apple Photos for a DAM um, and a high percentage of PP? I'm going to assume that's photo processing, picture processing, with Affinity Photos for final PP. Okay, so what he's asking... Okay, let's... Yeah, we'll start with this. Why not? This app, Photos, is a all-in-one everything app. Yeah, this is a good place to start anyway, isn't it? It's an all-in-one everything app, meaning it manages your pictures, right? This is where you organize them. This is where you can add keywords and things like that if you really want to. That's where you can view your photos on a map. You build little collections. Oh, this is my favorites from my trip to Paris, that sort of thing. All of that can be done inside of photos. You can also do all of your image enhancement, making your pictures look better, cropping them, rotating them, color correction, retouching, that sort of thing. And if there's something that you want to do that is, goes beyond what are the capabilities what are within the capabilities of photos itself, then you have third-party apps. You have the ability to use things as little plugins or they're not really called plugins, but effectively plugins, or you do a complete separate app and bring pictures back in. So ultimately, no matter what photo editor you like to use, and by photo editor, I mean something like Photoshop, Affinity Photos, any of the other Pixelmator Pro, any of the other number of apps out there that are for image manipulation, those apps don't do asset management, DAM, Digital Asset Management, or DAM. It, not the thing that holds back water or that thing you say when your kids aren't around, but Digital Asset Management. That is something that is not done by those other apps that I mentioned, but that is something that Photos is. It allows you to organize your pictures, keep track of them, sort out your favorites, and that sort of thing. Kind of important. Photos also has the beautiful advantage of if you are on the macOS ecosystem of syncing seamlessly and beautifully with your iOS devices, your phone, your iPad, all of your other Macs, every, they all get all the same pictures together, which is kind of awesome. And that in itself makes it tempting to a lot of people go, you know, the editor isn't that great, but I like all these other features. I like this whole integration with all my other devices. If you're a Mac household, you got Macs, you've got iOS devices, it really makes a lot of sense because it just makes things so much easier. Now, I said maybe the editor is not so good, but this is one of the big things in this new version for Mac OS High Sierra. The editor has gotten some very nice and very welcome improvements. And we're not going to go into all of those today at all because it's a ton of stuff and that's what the rest of the course will be about. But we will look at the a little overview. We'll just look at some of the things that are in there so we can get an idea of what is in store. It is a robust application. Now, if you want to use, if you want to use it primarily as a dam, and do some of your basic image editing in here, but then rely on third-party apps like Affinity Photos to do your bigger editing, you absolutely can. Now, that's something we'll get into in another series. We're not going to go into external editors today, but that absolutely is a viable workflow to have. So the fact that the, I think the most 
kind of critical component to look at when you're considering dedicating your photo library into photos is the fact that it integrates with the rest of your Mac and iOS devices. That's, that is really what it comes down to. That is what that one feature makes it so much more easy and cohesive to use across all of your devices. Now, there's a lot of things that it doesn't do that you would like it to do, things like family sharing, an easy way to sync my library with my wife's library kind of a thing. It doesn't do that. There are sharing capabilities, again, stuff we'll get into in other classes, that do allow you to share collections of pictures very easily with friends and family. But if you're of the mindset of, you know, I've got my iPhone, my wife's got hers, and I just want to have all of our pictures show up together, we're not there. And I'm hoping that we're going to get there one day, but given how far along we've come without anything even remotely like that, I'm, I'm not, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to get there. It would be nice. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit. The point is that as an asset management tool, it is robust. It really does the vast majority of things that the vast majority of people are going to need. It's free, comes with your Mac and with your iOS device, so that's kind of cool. And if you are using an iPhone and you take a lot of pictures on your iPhone, as pretty much anybody with any smartphone does, the fact that those pictures are automatically included in your library and are everywhere, that's really hard to argue with, right? That is a really, really convenient thing. So there's a lot of conveniences to using this system. Even if it's not the most robust editor, the most robust asset manager, the most robust of anything else that you might want, it may not be the best in all those regards, but the simple fact that it integrates so nicely with everything else does make it extremely, extremely attractive. So let's, let's just leave it at that. We'll start with that and we're gonna switch over to the app and start having a basic look at it. So let me get my, let me go back to a starting point here. <clears throat> Excuse me, and let's do it like, let's just start with a basic photos view like this. Boom. Oh, there it is. Okay. First up, on the left-hand side, you have your long scrolling view of all of your libraries and, uh, not libraries, but uh, albums that you have built in here and organized the way that you have. Now, this is nowhere near as organized as I would like mine to be. And there's a good reason for this. Uh, well, this is not really a good reason, but there's a partial good reason for this. You'll see this is largely a flat system in here. I do occasionally have a folder in here that might have some other stuff in it. If I open that up, you'll see that there are, if this decides to open, oh, and they've been removed. You'll see that there's folders, and inside of those folders, I would have different albums in there. This is... This is a key to organizing cleanly, to having folders with albums inside of the folders, whether you break the folders off by event type. Uh, these are my personal family vacation folders. Uh, these are my business if you're doing work stuff. And these are the pictures of my business if you're doing photography for your own business. These are, I don't know, pictures of my kids, whatever. You can put them into these folders and that's kind of nice because you don't have hundreds and hundreds of albums that are just a flat file. The problem, however, is that the way that the the um, API works when you are connecting to other apps is you'll probably notice this before. Even if you've put stuff into subfolders in here, things show up flat on other apps, which can be really kind of frustrating and tedious. So with that in mind, it almost makes it not quite as useful to put things inside of folders. And we're going to go into this a lot more when we get into the full-on organization part of this. But it's a little frustrating that that folder hierarchy doesn't get translated out to all the third-party apps that connect to photos. Just something to keep in mind. So if you're not doing that right now, if you're not putting them into folders, don't stress over it. The fact that they're just in albums, you have your folders organized in albums at all is an enormous thing to begin with. Just doing that really helps to keep yourself organized to know where your photos are. So if we go back to this, you'll see I have dozens and dozens of these. And the way that I tend to name things, um, you'll see I have this whole year, month, day system in here that I like to do. But if I wanted to group these together, so let's see, I've got a whole bunch here from this trip to Japan. I have no idea how these even got out of a folder because I know they were in one at one point. But if I wanted to organize those more cleanly, I could go up to the file menu and choose new folder. And we're going to call this, uh, where the folder went, oh, there it is. We're going to call it uh, 2015 Japan. I don't remember what the month was, so I'll just start with that. And then I could go down and find all of these Japan pictures. Let's see. I think that starts right here. Journey to Tokyo. And then this is my own personal library that we're looking at here. And we'll go down to the end of that, which looks like uh, there to the journey home. And oops, let's select that. Let's try that again. Shift click on the right one. Probably helps if I hold the shift key down. Where were we? To there. And you, and, and you can't. So the, you get into little weird things like that. You can't shift click on albums to select multiples and you're like, what, why? So then you gotta kind of do them one at a time. So you're there and then you gotta find the next one. Where was it? Hold on, where was it? Um, 
Ooh, somewhere down here. Uh, there is Skiji Market, so we grab that. Drag that. And so, so I'm not going to do this whole thing right here, but you get the basic idea. Sometimes these little things aren't quite as obviously capable as they should be. Like shift click albums and move them over. Why not? Anyway, so the point is here that you have this ability to organize things by albums, put those albums inside of folders, and really get yourself a nicely organized system. Now, you might be thinking, okay, uh, do I have to? Like, do I really want to do that? No. And this is one of the cool things about photos. When photos first came out, so this is now what, three, three years, four years ago? Whatever. Three years ago, let's just say it's three. When photos first came out, this capability to organize things into albums was always there, but it was hidden. And this is one of the new features of the High Sierra version. The, the view, that column view on the side is pervasive. It's always there. Whereas before it was something you turned on and off, now it's just, it's just there. And in the earlier versions, it was de-emphasized because the idea was that the operating system, Photos, is going to organize your pictures for you. It's going to create these things called moments and automatically group things together. And that's really nice when it works, but it doesn't always have everything that you want in it. So being able to create your own custom albums is kind of important. And I think that Apple finally went, all right, it's, uh, we get it. This is, the AI is good, but it's never going to do exactly what you want because it can't read your mind. And so we're going to let you do that and keep it a little bit more obvious. Like maybe you should, maybe you should do that. So the ability to organize things that way is really important. When you have thousands and thousands and thousands of photos in your library, if they're just one big mishmash of stuff, you're never going to find what you're looking for. But if you organize them into albums, that gets better. Now, on the point of never find what you're looking for, the, the search capabilities now incorporates a level of AI, a level of it searching through the pictures for you. So you type things like sunset and it tries to find pictures of sunsets, even though you haven't labeled them, called them a sunset, keyworded them, any of that. Again, that's the kind of thing we're going to get into in future courses as we dig deeper into it. But there is a level of that in here. How well it compares to Lightroom's new AI, in, which they're not calling AI, I always forget what they call it, but Lightroom's new one in the new Lightroom CC remains to be seen. I am going to, at some point, do a side-by-side -side of the two, photos versus Lightroom CC, because there is a lot of overlap and they are targeting very much the same market. Not today. But the AI is going to be a big part of that because... Uh, because it's a really interesting thing. For those of you who have watched the Lightroom CC training that I've done, you've seen when I go into a admittedly relatively small uh, library and I type in something like lion and it finds the lions and type in leopards and it separates the leopards from the lions. That's kind of awesome. That is pretty impressive that it can do that. So at some point we'll compare them and see how well they how well they compare. But Regardless, let's just go back to this for now. So again, point down here on the side is that you have all these albums that you can create to really organize your pictures, and it's really worth doing. Now, if we go back to the top here, you'll see that there are a collection of albums that are automatically created. So you have, these aren't albums, these are just kind of library preview sets, and we'll take a look at all of these in a moment there. I'm sure my wife's gonna be thrilled that I have that picture on there. Um, and then we have down here, she shared, and shared is something that you can share with your friends and family and loved ones. We will take a look at those later. But then underneath that, you get to these automatically created albums in here. You've got your media type where it separates out your videos, your selfies, so something taken with a front-facing camera on your iPhone. Live photos for those who use iPhones, you know what those all, that's all about. Portrait mode, panorama, slow motion bursts, screenshots, very nice because a lot of us do screenshots. It's nice to find those in one place. And then animated for doing the animations that you can do now in iOS 11. It's just kind of all organizing those together, which I don't think I've, I've done a single animation, have I? Oh, there's a couple. But those aren't actually animations. I have no idea why those are in there. Huh. Interesting. Anyway, um, so it organizes those for you there. Now, this stuff that you're seeing on the side here, it's not that this is new. It's just a different view for it. If we go back to the photos view and go up to the top, you'll see that you do still have your photos, your moments, your collections, and your years view. And this is an important view to look at here. The fact that you've got your entire year in this top-down view. And if you look at this right now, you go 2017, Okay, Germany, Sweden, Mexico, and the United States tells us where. Hold on a second. I had to have taken more pictures than that, right? Well, you did. There's a preference that you can look at in here. Summarize photos. Here we go. If we, go to, if we turn off summarize photos, then I actually see a thumbnail for everything shot in 2017, and you see that it's going to be enormous. But you'll also see in here a lot of similar stuff, right? It's like here's a whole row of pictures of my little baby, and they all look basically the same. Um, Oh, that was 2016. Let's go down to 2017. Here you see a bunch of pictures that look virtually identical. And it seems kind of silly to see that many thumbnails of the same thing in there, which is why you have this summarized view where it does kind of an intelligent grouping 
eliminates a lot of the dupes or close to dupes, and uh, but leaving enough together, you can tell there's a lot of pictures of a particular f- event or style or whatever in there, and so you can find them like this. And it's kind of cool. You go, okay, well, there's 2017. Uh, double click on that. It's going to zoom. Ooh, double click is going to zoom in like that. Not what I wanted. Back up. Back up. Uh, back to years. Uh, let's actually change. I think we used to double click to zoom into that. Let's go back to the years there. Things are always changing. Here we go. Let's click on this. Click on this view. That's going to take us to the map, isn't it? Hmm. Well, that's not exactly what I expected. Things have changed. Worth pointing out. If you were extensive photos user before, things have changed. Hmm. We're going to find out a lot of those. What a lot of those are as we go through it. And we hear this has taken us into a collection of 2017. So now we're seeing again that kind of high level view of stuff that happened in 2017 in there. Um, along with those little uh, nice little animations and so on. Those are something in, in moments, and we'll take a look at those later on. So anyway, the point is you have this top-down view, but it is intelligently spread out so that you're not just looking at a million pictures all at once. The collections down here, again, automatically created for you based off of location uh, and time, kind of combining things together, trying to give you a uh, the, the kind of thing that you would probably build by hand over here on the left, but not having to, just having these nicely collected in here uh, for you in groups that seem to make sense chronologically and based off of location. And that's worth pointing out too, location's a big deal inside of Photos. Photos is really optimized for stuff you shot on your phone because it does take advantage of the geolocation data. Obviously your your, uh, time and date, but you get that off of any camera. Although it may be wrong on your DSLR, DSLM camera, whereas on your iPhone, it's gonna be right. And then with that, combine that with the geolocation and you really do get an intelligent grouping of photos that works. It's when you start throwing pictures in from other cameras that things can get a little bit messy because the geolocation data is probably not there. Odds are your camera doesn't have GPS built into it. You can go in and manually assign things, but but who really wants to do that, right? So odds are that those things aren't going to be automatically grouped properly. So again, if you shot exclusively with your iPhone, Photos would probably be fantastic. As you start adding other photos into it from other cameras, it gets a little bit less intelligent at how it groups and organizes things together. But with a little bit of effort on your part, you can group things together and get them to kind of automatically come together. Adding locations, taking a group of photos, opening up the info on them and adding in a location, you know, Paris, Stockholm, whatever it might be where it was, add that in and then off it goes. Um, I'm going to hit a couple questions here because we are we're seeing questions come up here. Um, Daddy MCC says, wouldn't you say that if you plan to use the Apple photo app, do you absolutely have to pay for more storage? How much would you say you should get minimum? That is, there's no one answer for that. That is really dependent on your shooting style, I suppose, how much you're shooting and what kind of cameras you're shooting with. So yes, your cloud storage is something you have to pay for beyond, what do you get for free? A gig or two gigs or something. I don't remember what, maybe five. Anyway, it's not much you're going to fill that up pretty quickly. If all you ever do is shoot with your smartphone, then that is probably going to last for a long time. But as 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 soon as you start adding in raw pictures off of your, what, 30-something megapixel Sony camera, then you're going to need to add more space. As far as how much should you get, you don't need to worry about that until you start to run low. As you get close to the end, uh, close to capacity, just upgrade. There's no benefit for you to having more space than you need currently because you can upgrade at any time. If you are... Let's say you've got, what is it, a um, 25 gig? I don't remember what the plans are. Let's say, you've, let's just say there's a 25 gig plan. Maybe there isn't, but let's just say there is. And you're happily cruising along at 15 gigs and 20 gigs and 22 gigs and 23 and 24. And you get to 24 and it's starting to creep to the end. And you go, ooh, need more. Open up your phone or log in on, on photos and upgrade your plan. And immediately you have that extra access. There's no point in buying the space, the capacity before you need it. Now, if you're going to be importing let's say migrating an old library over, importing a whole ton of stuff at once, then maybe you'll feel that you want to do that. But even then, it'll tell you, hey, yeah, you've got the pictures here, but to sync to the cloud, you've now run out of space. It's time to upgrade. So yeah, I I wouldn't upgrade until you need to. There's just, there's really no plan for that. No need for that. Stuart says, are your images stored on your computer or in the cloud? Okay, this is a very good question. This is worth talking about here. We'll, We'll bring this up again later on as well. But Here is the idea. So you have the ability to choose, bring this up nice and big, um, whether your pictures are stored in the cloud or not. So just to turn this on or off, iCloud Photo Library. iCloud Photo Library means that your pictures, everything that you import into photos, gets pushed up to the cloud and then synced to all your other devices, iPhone, iPad, other Macs, so on. That's what the photo library does for you. Now there's two stages to this. 
If you want your pictures to show up on all devices, you have to have iCloud Photo Library. You get a certain amount of storage for free, so you can try it out, play with it, see what you think. And then, of course, as we just discussed, you can add more as needed. There is an option in here. Let me see if I can, if that's really readable like that. Let's zoom in this way. There's an option in here to download originals to this Mac or to optimize Mac storage. So what that means, if we can zoom this out just a little bit, maybe just leave this up on screen here. What that means is if you choose download originals to this Mac, then every photo that you take and or import whether it's on this Mac or not, will eventually show up in here because of iCloud Photo Library. They sync everywhere. It'll show up in here, and the original file will get downloaded and be stored on your internal hard drive. If you have a main system that's kind of your big desktop system with tons and tons of storage, why not enable that? It just makes sure that you have a copy of everything locally right there. And a lot of people don't want to trust the cloud completely. Like, that's great, you got the cloud and all, but I really want a copy of my pictures right here. And I also want to run my own local time machine backup. And I also want to run a CCC backup. And I'm going to also back up to Backblaze. And I want 15 different backups. Cool, good for you. But if you don't have space for that on any given device, you don't have to have that turned on. So the other option there, that one, is optimized Mac storage. And what optimized Mac storage is, is everything is stored in the cloud, regardless of your, your choice here, incidentally. But when you choose optimize Mac storage, only the most recent photos are stored locally in full resolution. Everything else is just stored as a thumbnail. And when you click on that thumbnail to look at it bigger, it goes, ooh, he wants to look at that picture, downloads it from the cloud, presumably, immediately and instantly, not always in practice, and you get that picture there ready to edit and manipulate. This is exceptionally useful on your devices that don't have as much storage, right? These things have, what's the max now, like 256 gig, I think, uh, and that's a lot. Uh, some of them have, what, 64, or even 32 gigs. So you don't exactly have a whole lot of room on your phone where you would have terabytes of storage on your desktop. So personally, my iMac, which is my main machine, has the download originals to Mac enabled there. So that's on there. So all of my pictures are stored locally, as well as being stored in the cloud. This is my laptop. So my laptop doesn't have that much capacity and I certainly don't want to, I don't need to store everything here. So I leave it set to optimize Mac storage and then only the most recent pictures are gonna be stored here locally, which is pretty cool to be able to do. Okay, so hopefully that answers the question, Stuart, whether they're stored uh, on the computer or in the cloud. The effective answer is both. Um, David says, are you cutting in and out? Oh, if you're seeing video cutting in and out or live, oh, look at that. My stream just went to poop. And we're back. Okay, sorry. Uh, the, for those watching not live, uh, my backup, Backblaze backup kicked in again. And that's my bad. I totally forgot to turn that off. So uh, my bandwidth went down, but we are back up online. I have stopped that off. So we should be good to go. Okay, so back into it. Um, so where was I backing up? Uh, whether you're stored in the cloud or locally, again, both on my personal system, it is all stored locally on my iMac, but not here on the desktop. So uh, on the laptop. So that's how that works. Okay. Mm, and that was that was the answer to that question. Okay, so let's move on to the next point here. Um, let's see, we talked a little bit about organizing. Now there's, okay, let's look at some of the other organizing things that we have in here. There's this moments, which moments are nicely created for you. And we can view these moments in here. Um, you can see this is kind of all one trip in here. It has automatically pulled together all my Sweden pictures into these little miniature collections. And then photos is just a view of everything, just a nice big flat view of everything, kind of an all photos view. Over on the left, you have these things called memories, and memories are really, really neat. These are randomly created, kind of spontaneously created, and you can see they automatically got named, they have a date on them, um, you know, they find like, here's a friend's of mine's birthday, and so it goes, oh, well, Jeffrey's 46th birthday, it was his birthday around then, sorry, buddy, I know you're getting old. Uh, you know, there's all these on this days, you'll still, you know, locations, Williams in San Francisco, um, Yuri's first birthday, it just Texas to Florida, track. all these things are automatically created. And they're really, really fun. These are the last week, and these are not chrono chronologically ordered right now. They're just a collection that are thrown together for you. And what's really cool about it is you get these automated notices that say, hey, we made a new collection for you. Check it out. And they're pretty slick. That's kind of a neat thing to have. It's definitely a fun way to revisit some old photos because it'll come up with something. Like one just came up a couple of days ago that said, past Christmases or something like that. I forget what it was called. And I played it. It's like, oh, look, Christmas from last year and the year before and the year before. And it's nice. You're getting ready for the holidays and suddenly there's this thing. So that kind of thing is really kind of neat that's in there. So that's some of the basic basic um, organization stuff you have in there. And then there's this favorite memories up here. You can see up here at the top. So if you have marked a memory as a favorite, it'll show up in there as well. Um, 
And we're going to go through all this organization in a bit more detail when we get into that level. It's just kind of a top-down, high-level view right now. You see all these different ways to organize. So essentially what this comes down to, the most important takeaway here is you can organize manually if you want to. You don't have to. Photos will organize for you regardless of what you do. And if you like the way that it organizes things for you, then that, that's it. Don't worry about it. Just be done. If, however, you want a more finite, more granular, granular level of organization, then by all means, take over and off you go and you can do that. Okay, let's take a look at editing because editing is one of the big things that you're kind of going, well, okay, what can I do with photos? Can I manipulate my photos the way that I want to? And so again, we're just going to take kind of a high level look at it. Let me find a, a decent photo to open up here. Um, and let's grab this one here. Why not? Um, this looks like lunch somewhere and switch over to this. So I double click on the photo. It opens into a full screen view. If I, I'm in full screen incident, let me zoom out of this, pull out of full screen real quick. So if I'm not in full screen mode, then the interface does change a little bit. And when I go bigger, so if I close that out again, open that up again, uh, you have this row of icons across the top. As with all macOS apps, when you go full screen, you lose that title bar. So it's worth remembering that if you roll your mouse up to the top, you are going to get some other options. And there's those options that we just saw. So what we want to work on is editing. I can just click on edit or I can hit return. Return is going to also take me into the editor. Hit return again. It's going to take me back out. But even without going into the editor, you have this little magic wand auto enhance button here. And that's a, that's a nice thing. Right, if you just go, oh, click that and see what happens. And okay, this photo didn't really do much of anything, but it will do some basic adjustments to that picture. But I don't want to do that. I go, eh, that was, that was no, not too bad of a change. Add a little contrast, a little color to it. But let's just get into editing and take a quick look at what um, at what we do have in here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Frank Lovett is asking, it looks like you use photos yourself. Is this for your personal photos, but do you use something else for your professional work? If so, what? Excellent observation, Frank, and yes. So I've, I would love to be able to use one app for everything. I used to. In the days of Aperture, everything was in Aperture. Personal and professional work was all in one place. It just got separated into two separate large folders. Personal, professional. Photos isn't enough for my professional work, so it cannot be used for that. Photos is plenty for my personal work. Having my personal stuff, my personal photos, talking about family photos, iPhone photos, show up on all of my devices is really, really so yes, I use photos for family stuff. To be honest, the vast which is almost embarrassing, but the vast majority of stuff that I shoot just in my family is on this thing because it's pretty great, right? I mean, it's for the most of you do, it's it's kind of, it's good enough. I don't, I don't really carry a camera if I'm going out to dinner with my kids or something. I don't carry a big camera. I take pictures with that if I want to take pictures. And then they're automatically organized. They're in there. They get geotagged. It's all there and it looks great. No, they're not as good as pictures I get off of my Lumix camera or if you're shooting, you know, Canon, Nikon, whatever. They're not going to be that good, as good as those. So if I do shoot a family thing, family vacation, kid's birthday, something like that where I go, okay, I'm going to shoot with a real camera, I do import those into photos so that they can be mixed together with the iOS pictures and all of those pictures show up everywhere. But when it comes to my business stuff, my work stuff, I'm using Lightroom. I'm currently using Lightroom Classic for the, for because I was using Lightroom CC, now it's Lightroom Classic for everything. I am playing with Lightroom CC. Lightroom CC is not uh, as big and robust as Lightroom Classic, but I do like a lot of its features. So I'm kind of playing with both right now, which is really annoying because it's like, I felt like I just finally settled on, I'm doing this here and this here, and now there's another over here, mm. but such is the life. Uh, anyway, so yes, I do all my personal stuff goes into photos and all the professional work goes into Lightroom. So there's the answer to your question. All uh, right, let's go back to this. <clears throat> so we're in the editor. Let's take a quick look at what's in here. There is a lot, and there is more now since the introduction of Mac OS High Sierra. One of the biggest changes in here, the biggest introductions is curves. And this is, this is nice. I'm a huge fan of curves. I like to be able to manipulate my photo with curves to adjust my contrast, even do color shifts. If I want to go to the red and pull a little bit, maybe it makes the shadows a little bit cooler, pull some of the red out of the shadows, I can do that. There's so much that you can do with curves. I mean, if you if you're not familiar with curves, it's phenomenal what you can do with it. Curves is always my favorite go-to. If I want to like really do image manipulation, I'm going to curves. We will do, I've done in the past, but it's been a while. I will do a comprehensive dive into curves. One of these classes, one of this live training series will probably be just about curves because it is so powerful. And the fact that it's in photos right now is really, really great. So you really do have that ultimate level of control. Now, curves is not for everyone. 
if you don't like curves, if it's too complicated, if you can't, if it takes too long to get what you want out of it, don't use it. No one says you have to. But knowing that it's there for those who want to, for those who whose brain says, yes, this method of working makes sense to me, it's so nice that it is there. This is something I'm very, very happy about. So we have the full curves manipulation in there. And again, as you can see, you, can, you have not just RGB, but full red, green, blue separations. So let's just take a quick run through the controls that we do have in here. Let me zoom into this a little bit. And in fact, actually, let me pull out of that. Let me close all of these momentarily so that we can more easily see exactly what's here. All right, everything's closed. So <clears throat> let's go up to the top, zoom into that a little bit. And we're starting with lightness controls. So this is a, I I should reset this picture real quick. Hold on, I wanna reset this picture, uh, revert to original. Okay, back to lightness. You'll notice if I open lightness, I open color, I open black and white, you have these nice big easy sliders here, which is really, really cool. So I don't wanna zoom in too far because I want you to be able to see the image as well, but you see this slider here. The image is darker, the image is brighter. And this is something that came from the very beginning of working with photos. I can make the picture darker. I can make the picture brighter. This slider in here is not a simple exposure slider or a brightness slider. It is not a single slider. It is a combination of multiple adjustments that are being adjusted simultaneously and intelligently based off of the photo that you're manipulating. So that light slider is not one slider. It is actually, if we open up the options on here, let's zoom in nice and tight on there. It is actually combination of brilliance, exposure, highlights, shadows, brightness, contrast, and black point. All of these are getting manipulated simultaneously, or, or depending, excuse me, depending on the image, some of them are. So let's just take this and drag it towards dark. Notice that not only is all these sliders not just getting, well, not changing the same amount, they are changing, some of them are changing the opposite direction. So brilliance, you might think, well, brilliance, well, I want to make it less bright. Wouldn't brilliance go down? Well, not necessarily. It has determined that this photo is going to take exposure down very little. Highlights, because there's a lot of highlight data, is going to take down more. Brightness, which is a more linear version of exposure, is going to take down quite a bit as well. Simultaneously increasing contrast, raising the black point, and quite dramatically increasing the brilliance. Oh, and raising the shadows as well. That is how it is determined is how to best make this image a little bit darker or a little bit brighter. If I were to, let me just reset this, if I were to take just the exposure and brighten it up, you can see how quickly my, my highlights get blown out, my shadows get really muddy. That's no good. Let's go to brightness, take my brightness up. Well, it's getting brighter, but it's getting flatter. It's getting darker, but all the shadows are crunching up. This way, I can very easily go, the whole picture is a little bit darker, a little bit brighter, and it works really, really well. So this is a big, big deal. The fact that you have one slider to adjust that simultaneously adjusts a whole bunch of other stuff. Look, look as I do this, look at the brilliance, how it kind of goes up and down depending on where I am. It's really quite remarkable what it does, and it does this throughout. So there's lightness, going to color, it's the same thing. I want to make the color richer or less rich. If I open up the options, we see what it is. We're adjusting saturation, color contrast, and color cast all at the same time. Now, in many cases, it's, well, there's so contrast goes up with saturation on the up. As I go down, contrast stays down, but saturation is dropping. Fantastic. So again, you have these capabilities to do this that is really, really neat. Switch back to the comments real quick here. Um, David Zung says, speaking of High Sierra, the university I work at issued a warning about 1013. Anyone with physical access to a Mac? Oh yeah, that's that's been fixed. Uh, that was a uh, root password thing, so that's been addressed. <clears throat> Frank Lovett says, do you agree that using the auto button makes sense as a starting point and then adjust each slider from there for preference? I think that is a great, great way to work. If you, <clears throat> let me back up. If you're a, a pro or advanced enthusiast, it's very easy to get caught up in the auto, auto, auto. I, I know how to make my own adjustments. I make my images look good on my own. I don't need an auto button. Come on, really? Like if the software can do it, for you, either get to where you wanted to be, or get maybe even better than where you wanted to be, or get you close to where you want to be with a single click, why waste time screwing around with all these sliders? There's nothing wrong with going auto, and if you go auto and it looks really good, you go, okay, well, I'm just going to move on to the next picture now, that was easy, or it goes, oh, it looks better, but it's not quite there, so then you tweak it a little more, or you look at it and go, oh. That wasn't the direction I was going to take it, but I really like the direction it went. Or you look at it and go, well, that sucks. If it sucks, undo it. Just hit undo and move on to the next one. It's one click and then another tap to undo. You can manage. So I really 
think that using auto as a starting point is a great idea. Why not? There's nothing wrong with it. There's no shame in using the auto mode. Besides, no one's going to know anyway. All right, so go for it. Just use it. If you like what it does, then great. If you don't, then undo it and move on. So yeah, I think auto is a great idea. So let's go back to it. Now we're back in here. Let's uh, subcolor. So, okay, let's just do that. Let me uh, let's reset again, revert to original. And if I look at the light slider and I go, ooh, do I want a little bit lighter, a little bit darker? I'm not quite sure. All right, let's reset that again. And I'll just hit the auto button. And what does it do? It's brought it up a little bit brighter. And I look at that and go, huh, I actually quite like that. Or I say, ooh, looks good, but I think it could lose a little bit more contrast. So I can take the contrast up a little bit. And maybe that's just because that's how I like it. Or maybe it's just because this picture needs it or whatever it might be you have that ability. So why not hit the auto button? There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so light, you've got color, you've got a black and white, if you want to do a little black and white, and as soon as you tap it, the image goes black and white, and then you're manipulating a whole bunch of stuff. Again, what are you manipulating? Intensity, neutrals, tone, and grain doesn't get done automatically, but you can go in here easily and go, all right, let's add some grain into that thing. Let's get it really chunky. Make that look like some cool, high contrast, chunky black and white picture. Cool, funky. Or auto, or undo it. You've got retouching in here. Again, this is stuff we are going to get into in individual uh, lessons as we do, as we dive in later. I just want to show you what's here. You've got retouching. You've got red eye control. I don't know when the last time I saw a red eye picture is, but it's there. You've got white balance. You've got levels, which we've had for quite some time. So love, love the levels. But again, new to High Sierra is curves, which is a huge improvement. Definition, very nice definition slider that's going to be localized contrast combined with color. It's a very nice thing to have. Selective color, this is new, the ability to manipulate individual colors. So I could say, let's just take my reds and make my reds less saturated, or reset that, grab the eyedropper, reset, hello, reset, there we go. Grab the eyedropper and say, I want this shade of yellow on the bamboo bowls to be less saturated. So I select that and then take the saturation down on there. Easy peasy to do. So that's really cool. That selective color thing is new and quite a nice adjustment, uh, improvement. Noise reduction, you got a high ISO noisy picture or just something taken on your iPhone in low light, noise reduction, amazing. And then sharpness, add a little sharpness to it. Can never hurt. Well, it can if you do too much, but we'll cover all that in another session. And then vignette, you wanna add a little vignette, a little creative vignetting, let's get a little creative vignetting on there and away you go. Or you can de-vignette. If you've got a, an image where the edge of the photo got a bit dark, um, you might be able to correct for that in here. Worth pointing out is that things like distortion correction are uh, Distortion correction, uh, defringing, these are things that are built into the raw decoder. So from this level of adjustment, you don't have access to those individual separate adjustments. Different tools might give you access to them. One in point is Raw Power. Raw Power is a third-party app. We've talked about it on, not in this show, but we've done it in Photo Moments. Um, it's actually created by my friend Nick Bott. It's a wonderful app that utilizes Apple's own raw decoder. It just gives you more access over the raw decoder than you have in Photos or any Apple native app, which is pretty darn cool. So it's not new adjustments. All the adjustments that that raw photo raw power does are built into the operating system. It's just giving you access to things that Apple hasn't given you access to. Pretty slick. So if you want better raw decoding or more control over it, look up raw power. And we'll talk about that again when we get to the uh, plugins and external editors section of the um, of the course. Uh, let me quick, quickly go back to the comments here real quick. Michael uh, Schulte is asking, can the image optimization you have shown be applied to raw files too? Oh yeah. I mean, this is a JPEG. Be I think it's a JPEG because this was shot on the iPhone, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, but yeah, yeah, all this, everything I'm doing here, everything you're seeing works on raw or JPEG. Absolutely. Um, is there any local adjustments tool? Brushes? No. I'm trying to remember if they added brushes. I don't think they added brushes. I don't think there's any brushes in here yet. Pretty sure not. That, for that, you have to go to external apps. I'm going to feel really stupid if I'm wrong about that because that's a big deal. But I haven't, I don't think so. If I'm wrong, don't kill me. Uh, but I don't think so. Okay. Let's go back to this. All right. So there's video. So there's a quick run through of the adjustments that you have. And you can see here, it's giving you a little check mark showing you what you've, what you've played with. Uh, basic stuff like, you know, image rotate, if your image is crooked for whatever reason, or, you know, needs to be straightened, um, which incidentally, where was, uh, oh, cropping's up here. Cropping's a whole separate thing. And you've got your cropping tool here if you want to crop it or do some uh, straightening, right? If you need to just kind of do a little basic straightening, but that up there is for the flip. Favorite, market picture is a favorite. Um, this gives you into the external extensions, which again, we're going to cover all that stuff in future 
future courses. And then a little info here that gives you a lot more information about the picture. It tells you what it is. Yep, it's a JPEG, what it was shot on, iPhone 7 Plus, et cetera, et cetera. And your location, because it was shot with a iPhone. So our location is in there and we can find out which restaurant it was that I was dining in, not breakfast at Tiffany's. There he goes, Ming Hao's Dim Sum. That's where I ate that fabulous bit of dim sum there. So there you have it. Excellent. Um, all right. Retouching sounded like local adjustment. Well, sure, Michael, retouching is local, but that's, I, I mean, I'm assuming you're talking about things like painting in color, dodging and burning, stuff like that. I don't, I'm pretty sure it's not. I can't believe I don't have the answer for that at the top of my head. Sorry, but I'm pretty sure it's not there yet. Um, okay, and then let's go back over here. You've got filters. This is fun. So if you want to just look at some basic filters, there's not a lot. There's not a lot, and I'll be honest, they're not that great. But, um, but you know, if you find one that you like, then, hey, cool. Add a filter to it and call it done, and off you go. And then back into our primary adjustments where we just were. Um, yeah, a little side-by-side, -side, a little quick little you know, before and after compare, and you got your reset. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to do here. I just want to show you some of the kind of overview of what is in the adjustments in there. What else do we want to cover while we're in here? Um, there are, let's see here, oh, little icons that show up on here. This is kind of handy. It tells you a little geotag that image has, has got a location on it. That image has had adjustments applied to it, that sort of thing. You do have smart albums in here. So if you want to go create a new smart album, and now we're jumping around quite a bit, but a, a variety of criteria in here that you can you can create smart albums based off of keyword or who's in them and so on because the whole people thing is really, really cool in here, which um, I glossed over that before, but let me jump back into that real quick. The ability to see things by people is phenomenal. So you, if you take the time to, uh, to start labeling some of your people, some of your favorite people in here, it will then go in and start to automatically add people to the collection. So you've got your wife, your kids, your cousin, whatever, your friends, you start labeling them and then it automatically does. And this is one of those things that I've always said is kind of a fun, you got a minute or two to spare, you're standing in line somewhere at the Starbucks or whatever, and you're like, mm, instead of cruising Facebook, jump into photos and just open up a, one of the people albums and it'll say, hey, there's new pictures that need to be approved. Is this actually person X? And you just do yes, no, yes, no. It's kind of like a, like a, you know, hot or not, swipe, you're like, yes, no, yes, no. And you can do that, and that's really cool. And then you can further refine that, and that helps the AI throughout, because then when you do things like say, hey, S-word, or my device is to wake up, show me pictures of my son, you get him. When you say, hey, S-word, show me pictures of my family last Christmas, it automatically pulls those together because it knows your relationships, it knows who the people are because you've been training it, it obviously knows when Christmas is, and off you go. That sort of thing is really, really cool. And it it really does work. I mean, I, I use this example a lot. You've probably heard it before, but I remember once in the car with my wife, we're going somewhere and we're, I think Halloween was coming up. We're talking about the costumes that we wore last year. And it was an argument of, um, no, no, that was last year. No, it was the year before. And so I said, hey, phone, show me pictures from last Halloween. Boom, they came up and just like that. While in the car, while just there they are pretty cool, right? That kind of capability is really neat. I won the argument, by the way. So that's that's really slick that you have that capability in there. Um, all right, so there's that. There's the people thing. Um, what else do we want to do? So we, yeah, we people I'd kind of skip before. Places. So places, again, this is something we'll spend an entire course on, but this is showing all over the country or all over the world where your pictures are um, geotagged in so you can see exactly where they were taken. And again, this happens automatically when stuff is shot on your iPhone or if you select a bunch of pictures and add them to the map manually, you can do that as well. So that's all nicely in there. Um, let's see, what else I want to cover in this basic overview? We've looked at the kind of what it's what is included in here. Again, auto import from your iPhone, manual import, which is something we'll look at specifically. We talked about organization, basic organization here in smart albums, the ability to have it organized for you based off of specific criteria. And then of course there's the organization that happens on its own up there. Uh, you have projects, so let's, um, let's see here, we're gonna do this. Let's do, uh, oh, things like slide, come on, where are you? Slideshow, automatically playing, playing slideshows for you, so you get a nice little slideshows with music, that whole thing can happen. Um, create books, calendars, cards, slideshows, and prints, so we will look at all of these, and then more access to third-party services. That is something new in High Sierra, so we'll be taking a look at that in, throughout the course. We have the ability to create all of these things, which is really, that's really neat, right? It's so easy to say, oh, I want to make a little calendar um, gift for the Christmas, you know, perfect Christmas gift, right? You make a calendar for the next year, select some favorite photos, create a calendar, and off you go. In fact, let's just see. I wonder, what is today? Today is the 14th. 
I wonder if I was to order a calendar today. Let's go back and see. I haven't looked at this in a long time. I'm going to do a 12-month calendar starting January of next year. Continue. Choose a theme. I go, I don't know. Sure, why not? Picture calendar. We do that. And we start adding our photos into it. Um, uh, once I've done there, I would buy a calendar. Let's just, um, I don't know if it'll, it probably won't let me continue until I actually add pictures. Oh, continue, incomplete calendar. Yes, yeah, not going to let me do it. I'm wondering um, if you could get this ordered in time and have it for Christmas this year. Might be a bit tight, but it might be, hap- might be possible. It might be possible. It's a good idea. You should probably go do that. Uh, Frank Lovett has a question in here again. Let me switch back over to this. Frank says, how about culling? There's no star ratings, but I have a great way to use keywords in the improved search now makes that a feasible approach. Okay, that's, this is a very good question. One of the things that is missing in photos, which is still not there, which at this point you have to think is never coming, is star ratings. When it comes to culling photos, and by culling, what Frank means is you've just imported a thousand pictures from your trip, your shoot, your event, whatever. At some point, no one wants to see a thousand pictures, so I got to narrow it down to my favorite hundred, favorite fifty, favorite five, whatever it might be. Typical way to do this is through star ratings. I go three stars, four stars, oh, that one's worth two, and then you upgrade and downgrade them and so on. You can't do that in here. You have favorites, and that's it. So you can say, that's a favorite, that's not a favorite. Now, what Frank is suggesting is that you can use keywords, and you can. You can use keywords, and you could call the keywords one star, two star, three star, whatever you want. The problem with keywords as a star replacement is if I'm doing stars, and I've rated something three stars, and then I rate it four stars, it is not three stars and four stars, it's just four stars. If I change that to two stars, it's just two stars, not four and three. If I'm using keywords as star ratings, I add a keyword of three stars, and then I go, you know what, this is worth four. So I add a keyword of four stars, I now have to re- to remove the three star rating keyword. And if I forget, now the picture's got both three and four star ratings. Well, which is it? Did I upgrade that? Did I downgrade it? I don't know. So using keywords as star ratings is definitely not a great suggestion. Frank, if you've got a, a more a better way to do that, let me know. I'd love to hear what you're saying. Just quickly type that out and I'll I will share that with the audience here. But um, in general, Keywords as as star ratings isn't very good. You can mark the favorites. You could mark a bunch that you think are favorites and then go back through those and take off the favorite ones that you decide you don't like. You could take ones that you really like, mark as favorites, dump them into an album, take the favorite ratings off of those, and then go through the albums and maybe rate those as favorites that you still like and kind of repeat that process. Um, there's, There's just no good replacement, though, for real star ratings, and I'm still really disappointed that it's not in here, which is super bummer. David says, I have to import my videos from my iPhone manually into photos. Is there an automatic way to import them now? Well, there's always been an automatic way, David. Uh, you must make sure that you have your iCloud photo library enabled on all devices. And f- you could even use the old method, which is not iCloud photo library. I forget what it's called now. Uh, but I mean, the iCloud photo library has been around for, what, three years now? I think super easy, just as long as it's turned on on both, on all devices, both devices, then they should just automatically show up. You should not have to be importing manually. If everything is turned on and it still isn't happening, call Apple Care. There's a, there's a reset procedure that you can do, but I also want to make sure that you don't hit reset and wipe out all your pictures. So you want to make sure that you've got everything intact before you do that. So um, more support than I can give you right here, but absolutely you should not have to import your pictures manually. You never should have since the introduction of photos on whatever version version of the macOS that was. But um, yeah, that should be happening automatically. Frank says, but you can use the improved search and tick the say two star and three star and get both. So yes, again, but it's, it's, again, it's the keywords. It's the problem being when you upgrade or downgrade an image from two stars to three stars or vice versa, the old rating is still there unless you manually get rid of it. So, and the problem is that you might be upgrading and downgrading. You know, it's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to give all my pictures two stars. And then I'm going to go, uh, all the ones I like, two stars. And then I'm going to look at them again and all the ones that I like even more, and I'm going to give them three. So it's got three and two, but that's okay. I'm only upgrading or uprating. But if you also tend to downgrade, which I do, my workflow involves starting with a three-star middle point and then rating up and down as I cull over and over again, the keyword process totally does not work. David says, my photos import fine, just not my videos. Oh, your videos should be importing as well. So yeah, it should all work. Definitely call Apple Care if they're not showing up. So there you go. Okay, um, let's see here. So there's the projects. We're talking about projects. I think that's about all we're going to look at today. That's a that's a basic overview. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty good solid overview. So again, you have this tool that is a both a digital asset management tool, a DAM tool, and an image editor. 
It is not the most phenomenal of both of those, of either of those, but it is a very good middle road, more than the vast majority of users need, solid tool. It works. It's compat- it works across all your devices. Your pictures show up everywhere. It is really hard to argue with that. It is really hard to debate the convenience of having your pictures show up everywhere. The image editing tools that you have, especially with High Sierra, are quite good now. They've gotten better and better, and things like curves in there certainly makes me really happy. You've got automated organization plus manual organization if you want. You have faces so all of your friends and family can get categorized and tagged and then easily found later on. You've got places so you can see where all your pictures were taken and if they don't show up with a location automatically, you you can manually add them to the map. Super easy to do. You've got books and albums and calendars and greeting cards and all that sort of thing, which let's face it, there's just no, for family, family and loved ones, there's nothing better than and more personal than a gift that is made from your pictures like that, whether it's a book or a simple greeting card or a calendar, whatever it might be. That's that's pretty good. You know, I'm thinking as soon as we hang up here, I'm going to make a calendar because that's just awesome. It really is. Do it. If you can get it for Christmas and time, and time for Christmas, for sure, you should just do it. It's really nice. Um, And yeah, and that's, that's the basic gist of it. So we will be looking into all the extended features. We'll go through over the course of this course, we will go into the individual uh, adjustments one by one. We'll pick them apart. We'll show how they work. We'll show what's good. We'll show what's bad on all of them. We will dive into organization in depth and talk about manual organization, automatic organization. We'll look at people and how to automatically get your people organized once you start doing it by hand, which incidentally, another major point on macOS High Sierra is that the faces library is now shared across all devices by some move that I cannot possibly comprehend. Previous versions of photos, if you did faces on your Mac, they did not show up on your iPhone and vice versa. Now it is a shared library everywhere. And so we'll talk about how to take advantage of that. There's a lot of good stuff in here. A lot of good stuff. Um, One more question that we're going to bail out of here. Frank Levitt is asking, what is your go-to external editor from photos for additional workflow or stylization? For example, Affinity Photo. I I, I don't have a go-to because I... I have like all the apps, <laughs> it's part of my job, right? So I tend to have everything, a lot of everything. And so there isn't a, go- a go-to. go To be honest, the vast majority of family photo type things get minimal, minimal retouching done to them. They're just like a basic Im- image enhancement and I'm done. Uh, I occasionally will do kind of uh, like a vintage look, not vintage, whatever. I wanna apply a style to them, a, a look to them. I love using Polar. No, sorry. And, no, Polar's great. I, I do love Polar, but um, great. Now I'm totally forgetting the name of it. Let me just pull up a picture in here and pull up the editor. And because I'm totally forgetting what it's called, Prime with two I's, P-R-I-I-M-E. It's a very simple way to apply a look to your images. Love it. So if I'm going to apply a look, that's the one I'll go to. Um, you know, I've got all the Affinity tools. I've got all the Mac Fun tools, uh, but from for personal work out of photos i just don't leave photos that much because especially now it does pretty much what i need it to do working in lightroom is totally different story lightroom's got more tools in it than photos does and of course lightroom you also have access to all these other tools that's totally different story there i'm spending a lot more time doing a lot more image manipulation but kids pictures of the kids birthday party you know I'm probably just using the JPEGs anyway because they look great and maybe a little image enhancement and off we go. So so hopefully that answers that question. All right, guys. Uh, oh, last, okay. Freddie says, building on David's question about importing video, I'm on OS X El Capitan. Oh, that's old. I mean, you can only import videos by tethering the phone. Has that become auto and high Sierra and Sierra and high Sierra? Oh, yeah, that's been auto for ages. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's been auto for a long time. So, right. Oh, Capit- El Capitan. Yeah, that does sound vaguely familiar. That was a long time ago. You haven't upgraded in a while. Um, but yes, automatic for sure, because I and I'll show you just just to drive the point home. Uh, let's get out of here. There's an old test image that I opened up there. If we go up to here and I click on videos, these are all I well not all, but these are a lot of iPhone videos. That's not iPhone video, but um these are like this is iPhones. I shot this yesterday. Um and this is just a little like this, these videos are all from the iPhone and these are automatically synced over. Absolutely. And then of course any other video that you have in your library shows up in there as well. Okay. That's it, folks. I hope that was interesting to you. We knocked this out in an hour. And uh, if you are, if you want to dig, 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 dive deep into all of this, uh, come back in January. So our first full course will be January 2nd, I believe. 
that doesn't matter. You'll find that on the calendar. Um, go to photoapps.expert slash live. You will see the next event showing up there momentarily. Um, you can also subscribe to the calendar in there. You'll see it on there. Subscribe, and there's a thing in it with instructions. Follow the instructions. It tells you how to subscribe, not just download the calendar. So you get automatic updates on your personal calendar of when these classes are happening. Um, again, if you are totally new to this live training thing, the way that this works is live training are always, always, always free when they are live. The advantage of being here live, of course, is you get to ask questions. However, if live doesn't work for you because you got yourself a day job, it's just not working in a time that works out for you, you can always view them later. There is a fee to either download it or if you are a paid member at photoapps.expert, to learn about that, just go to photoapps.expert slash member. You can subscribe there at $7 a month or $70 per year, and that gives you unlimited access to all of these live training videos. Streaming, not for download, but for streaming, makes it super easy. Watch on your phone, watch anywhere. Um, at any time. As long as you're paid member, you have access to the entire library. And so if you are into learning photos, but um, but can't be there for all the live ones, then consider the membership. That is a great way to go. All right, folks, that's it. I'm out of here. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next time. See you next year for this class, for this uh, series. Bye-bye.